normally people would attack near a fortified base or near a harbor and you would land away on a on an unfortified beach and mass yourself there and then go attack coastal fortifications or try and storm a harbor and take a harbor so that you could bring in men and supplies. We studied amphibious training and doctrine and we decided that we wanted to be able to land more directly onto the beaches to avoid enemy interference. And starting with Gallipoli in World War I, they saw that you could land on unimproved beaches and they had very primitive landing craft. But the biggest change in World War II, the size of the armies had grown so large that there were no areas that were undefended. So while the idea of landing at a port like Dieppe, uh, you know, that disaster showed that ports were too heavily defended to try and capture. You would have to land on a beach, an unimproved beach, but even an unimproved beach was defended. Andrew Higgins was a civilian entrepreneur who designed a boat in 1926 that would be able to work on the Louisiana Blackwater. And one of the things he saw when he came to New Orleans was a need for a boat that was able to land on an unimproved shore. In this area we had a lot of oil and we had trappers. And they were often working in the coastal waters and bayous of Louisiana and they needed to be able to land on an unimproved area, an unimproved beach and unload supplies or load supplies and then pull off again. And what you need on a boat to do that is turbulent water at the bow so that you can run in very shallow water and you need nice still water at the stern so that the propeller doesn't cavitate. And he kept working on different designs and, and trying different things and the story goes that one day his crew was building a boat and they would pulled some braces out of the inside of the boat before they were supposed to. The, the hull shape warped and Higgins was very mad at them and he said, well, go ahead and finish it. And it turned out that that was a shape that you know, lent itself to turbulent water at the bow and still water at the stern. And he improved on that and eventually built what he called his Eureka boat. And that, that was a, looks today more like a cabin cruiser. Most of the most successful businessmen in the 1940s promoted themselves. If you sat quietly in your factory and waited for business to come to you, you didn't have any business and you went bankrupt. Higgins had great confidence in his product and he went to great lengths to ensure that everyone knew he had that great product so that he could sell that product and advance it. And so he had this boat and when he heard that the Navy was working on plans for landing craft. Uh, you know, before this, Marines were still going ashore in longboats. And that just wasn't gonna work. Everybody knew that was a bad idea. And so there were trials to come up with a new design. Higgins went with his boat and the Navy thought, oh, what do you know about boats? He created a competition between the Navy's idea of what a tank landing craft should be and his idea. And his idea was, in his judgment, much superior. So he recommended to the Navy Bureau of Ships that they have a competitive test just south of Norfolk, and it was a rough day. I was in a boat alongside the two that were tested, watching. They got the boats and they came out of Norfolk Harbor. It was a rough day, real rough, and turned south. And when they turned south, they got in the seaway. And the Navy boat almost upset. The crew hanging onto the boat, our outer skin of the boat. Higgins turned, went in, landed, retracted, landed again three times, no problems. They changed the contract for 1,200 boats and gave it to Higgins, then and there. Captain Victor Krulak, U.S. Marine Corps. As many uh, industries did, they did start out small, and as they got contracts, they grew and grew and grew. So the first boat he came up with was classified as the Landing Craft Personnel Large, which didn't have a ramp on it. The LCPL has several bulkheads across the, the vessel so that the troops aren't all sitting in the troop compartment at the beginning. So either you jump off towards the stern 
or you have to get up and move forward across, you know, the engine was right in the center of the boat. And unfortunately, the men had to clamber out over the sides, which made them vulnerable to enemy fire. So they decided to modify it by incorporating a ramp so that the men could literally advance directly out of the boat. There are various stories of how the ramp came about. Um, one of them uh, indicates there was a Marine who was in China and saw a Japanese landing craft with a bow ramp and sent pictures of it back to Washington and this eventually filtered back to Higgins. And so the, uh, eventually they do end up with the LCVP, Landing Craft Vehicle and Personnel which is built with a bow ramp, and that's the classic uh, Higgins landing craft. They were used all over the world. They were used in Africa. They were used in Europe. They even brought these kind of boats inland to cross the Rhine River into Germany. We use the LCVPs for a variety of missions, and one of them was logistics. We were able to use them from ship to ship, from ship to shore. We transported supplies, ammunition, few, food, medicine, fuel. Uh, casualties, we evacuated prisoners, um, civilians, we helped them with humanitarian assistance. When you look at World War II, there were more casualties in the 8th Air Force than there were in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, of course, when a B-17 or B-24 is hit, it's headed down and everybody on board, sometimes two or three men would get off, but you know, uh, often the whole crew is lost. If 10 Marines hit the beach and a shell goes off near them. Uh, two or three might be killed and the rest might be wounded, but they can very quickly, in, in relative terms, very quickly be gotten off the beach and back to a, a hospital ship. LCVPs were actually fitted with a rack that was, you know, it was two by fours that fit in slots so that you could double deck the stretchers when they were bringing people off the beach. They could bring, of course, people who were mobile or stretchers. And there was a lot of space inside. It was easy to load them through the ramp. And oftentimes they would go back either to hospital ships or LSTs. And LSTs, once they had dropped their loads of tanks or trucks or whatever, were set up to be hospital ships. They often contained extra doctors and things with the understanding that they would be a portable hospital, provide early care, first on and then when they were full they would go back uh, in this case to England or go back to you know, some rear area. The LCVP made a great uh, small barge, small lighter, self-propelled, lots of cargo space, could move material between ships from ship to shore. We used to pick up supplies and bring it to the island and they would put it in storage and if a future ship needed any particular plot of supplies, they would call it in and they would put it in cargo nets and have it available when the ship arrived. And then they would put it in the landing craft, would bring it out to the particular ship that ordered it. They'd put a hook down, would hook up the net, they'd put it on the boat, ship, and uh, when they completed, give us the net back maybe pick up a second load, and that's how it was done. Over 20,000 LCVPs were produced, and, and I believe the figure is that uh, over 98% of the craft in the Navy were Higgins design. Uh, many of which were built by Higgins, but Higgins did have other plants that were using his design. So, you know, the, the vast majority of vessels in the Navy were Higgins and thus they had the development of the landing craft vehicle and personnel, LCVP, which General Eisenhower pointed out was one of the most important Allied inventions of the war. That was our first landing in the Pacific, and we hadn't quite got all the pieces of the puzzle together there. And, and of course, the other one of the things that was very difficult there, the question of um, sea superiority, I guess you could say, was very much in doubt. We, we didn't own the ocean around Guadalcanal as we did at later battles. And so there was constant naval attacks between our forces and the Japanese. It was an unopposed landing. The, we got ashore and captured the airfield, which we named Henderson Field in the honor of one of our marine aviators lost at Midway. And what happened was we were able to land over an open beach unopposed and everything went reasonably well. The fighting that occurred, occurred mostly later. Uh, 
Guadalcanal, we had the LCPL, and we had an LCP uh, and LCMs, but no LCVP hadn't been developed yet. We had made practice landings at uh, Onslow Beach in North Carolina over and over and over. Uh, we made so many practice landings and offloaded uh, into uh, landing craft. The mortar platoon and machine gun company, we had to have the ramps. Uh, we had a lot of Higgins boats for the rifle companies that had no ramps. Now we did make some practice landings with them with the mortar, but it was it was almost impossible to uh, get a base plate up and over the gunnel of that thing and uh, uh, into a water that was uh, uh, waist deep and all, you know. It just was nearly, nearly couldn't be done. The training was always get off the beach. That's basic. Uh, you're, uh, you're to come ashore and you're to get off the beach, spread out uh, as much as possible. The, the life aboard uh, a, a troop ship is so bad that you're anxious to get off of that damn troop ship. It doesn't matter <laughs> if you're blown off of it. But you know, you're, you're packed in there like sardines. You uh, are on that thing week after week after week with no fresh water showers, no way to wash your clothes, uh, two meals a day. We were so young and so stupid and we had no concept of what war was supposed to be like or anything. No, uh, we were not nervous. We figured that somebody knew what was supposed to be done and that uh, the good Lord would take care of us. But as far as sitting around chewing on our fingernails, there wasn't any of that at all. We were really happy to get off of that thing, even if it meant we were gonna be killed. We weren't, we weren't nervous, we just wanted off of that troop ship. Where we landed, the, uh, the coconut trees came right down to the beach. I remember it was black sand. We came out of the uh, ramp and there was a rifle company guy sitting on coconuts opening them and laughing at us. <laughs> Cause we, we just knew that we would all be killed in the first few minutes, you know. And they were sitting there laughing at us. So we joined in and started opening coconuts. Uh, the Japanese had no troops on there when they landed. It was just uh, maybe uh, engineers and the rest of them were Korean workers. And it took a right good while before they got many troops on there. The first ones came on, they, uh, I think about a thousand, they were going to kick us off. Then we left those coconut trees behind us and uh, walked on uh, through some grass and uh, scrubby jungle. They had run into a uh, stream that they could not cross, and we called it the uh, Tenaru. There was a corpsman who said, oh, I had been up there yesterday. I know exactly where you are, up on the Tenaru River. So uh, <clears throat> I said, uh, well, where is it? He said, well, I'll tell you. He said, there's quite a few Jeeps running around, and if you you grab a jeep or ask him to give you a ride up to where each company is, tell them on the Tenaru River. The Tenaru uh, uh, episode really began uh, uh, days and nights ahead of time because uh, there was night after night after night there when nothing happened. Uh, I say nothing happened. Uh, uh, you spend the whole night listening. They had given us 55 rounds to last for the night and only you could fire it on it. And they said when you had the, the uh, gift of an opportunity, meaning when a flare went off and you could see the Japanese, you could fire it, but you can't just keep firing. We'd be out of ammunition a half hour. We knew we were going to get attacked that night, and we were all very set up and uh, 
the Japanese, when they came across, they came across almost, uh, you, you might say, in a, a group of just crazy uh, banzai charge screaming and yelling. And, and we fired it, and uh, all the machine guns, what have you, opened up on the Teneru River. And it was a pretty lively action. When the battle commenced, uh, it was different. It wasn't friend of fire or somebody had heard a cow or, or somebody had uh, uh, heard a iguana uh, or something. I mean, the whole world erupted uh, up and down the, uh, the lines. Every once in a while when a flare went off and you could see Japanese, we would fire this, this 37 millimeter cannon with a grape shot and uh, you could see them, and when you fired it, all of a sudden, it was all clear. You couldn't see any Japanese, and uh, it wiped them out. It was dark, but uh, there was a lot of flashing from all the uh, fire and all. There was no cheering or anything like that following the battle. People felt pretty happy that we uh, uh, won it, but uh, you could look out there and see all these bodies, and. Uh, it makes you think uh, a little bit how, uh, you know, how short life can be. They look like raggedy ass Marines. You know how that is. The clothes are half worn out and the shoes are half rotted off and they've already begun to lose weight left and right. They were glad to see us because we brought 10 units of fire. A unit of fire is uh, all that one division can shoot up in one day. We went aboard Higgins boats and went up the beach. Uh, it's a pretty good ways uh, to a place where it's Mount Austin. And we landed on a pose and forced our way in, but we got very short distance until we ran into great numbers of Japanese. And Fuller found out we were in trouble and he came off the Matanaka. He had one company, one of our companies on the Matanaka yet and got in touch with one of the old four stack of destroyers. And they had five inch guns and they had a battery of five inch guns. So they were uh, talking to each other about semaphore, that's the flag. And we forced our way back to the beach. The Coast Guard came in and picked us up. That was when a man named Monroe and the Coast Guard was awarded the Medal of Honor, the only Medal of Honor a Coast Guardsman ever got. He was instrumental in getting his boats back in in time to pick us off that beach. It was a real snafu. If Chesty Puller had not been able to evacuate those Marines, the Japanese would undoubtedly have overrun and slaughtered them. The worst thing I ever went through in my whole life was October 12, 1942. Two battleships, four cruisers, and a bunch of cans pulled in the slot and dropped anchor and just proceeded to shell the hell out of us at to the tune of about 1,014 inch, and I don't know how many 12s and 10s, and nearly everybody on the island had a concussion of some kind. And uh, those big rounds that land close to you, and you'd bleed from the nose and the mouth. That's when I lost my hearing. We put everything we had in it, and so did they, because whoever the powers to be knew that who won that thing was going to take over the war. When we attacked Tarawa, the main atoll Bishio was surrounded by a coral reef, or actually segmented reefs. Coral grows anywhere there isn't fresh water. So on any island that's got a river where large quantities of fresh water are coming into the lagoon, the coral dies and there's a natural opening into the lagoon. Well, Tarawa doesn't have a river. What happened was the British, who had held the island before the Japanese captured it, actually notified, they warned us, that the tide would be such that it might be low enough that some of our boats might get snag, hung up on the reef. They might snag. They looked at the tides. They thought they could get the Higgins boats over. But when it came time to, to actually invade, there was an odd neap tide, and the reef was, was exposed. There wasn't enough 
water to get the Higgins boats over. The Marines had to get out, in some cases, 800 yards through the water. The Japanese machine gun and mortar fire just decimated them. I knew which battalions were going to be first landers, and I wanted the guys to be with them. So a couple of weeks before we were to offload or, or load onto ships, rather, uh, I sent my guys out to these battalions so that they could know the people in the battalion, know the commanding officer, and, uh, and so that the people in the battalion would know that they were with them weren't strangers. And so I picked for myself the battalion commander I thought would be in the trouble the most, and that would be where the best pictures would be made. And his name was Jim Crow, he was a major. We landed on Tarawa about early, supposed to be eight o'clock in the morning. They postponed it and we finally went ashore at 8.30. I was in the first wave and the first and second waves were amphibious tractors. We got ashore, but in getting to the shore, we rode on coral for about 600 yards. And, but all of a sudden, he saw the amphibious tractors that had carried in most of the first three waves uh, sort of piling up against the pier. I jokingly later used to say that it looked like an automobile junkyard. They were piling up on each other because the pier stopped them. But what was happening was that there was a Japanese machine gunner buried in a tank top on one side over there and he was shooting machine gun bullets at these, these, these tractors and and they weren't heavily armored or anything. And we got ashore and we tried to climb the wall and of course the gunners were out. By that time the gunners were out, the uh, Air Force had done its preparation and they'd quit and uh, they shelled the damn thing and they said, well, they somebody told me that the shelling for Tarawa was supposed to be about equivalent of four square four four pounds of TNT per square foot of land. He says that much exploded, they're gonna sink the damn island. But uh, when the track landed, two of the guys went off the right side, they're dead, they're still there. Two of them went over the wall, they're dead, they're sitting there. And the rest of us just sat there for a while. And but that was causing Jim Crow to sit out there and say, I'm losing my beachhead. I don't have any beachhead in there, and I've got all these boats coming in. We were in Red Beach 1. Next was Red Beach 2. The Japs denied the left half of Red Beach 1 to us, and all of Red Beach 2, all the way down to the pier. Cox and Gunder. And away we went, and as he hit the reef, which we knew he would do, why, he pulled the gag to lower the ramp, and it wouldn't go down. So that meant we all had to go up over the side. The side of the, of the LCVPs was about shoulder height on me. The boats hung up anywhere from four to 600 yards offshore. The guys had to get out and wade ashore, and said, all of the portion of the beach that they didn't have, the Japanese machine guns were in force, and they just riddled those people. They were also using anti-aircraft guns and shooting at those people wading in. After, after uh, uh, Jim Crow put us in on the beach, uh, the first boats to come in, and I was sitting there with my back to the seawall, loading a camera and having to watch this, as soon as it hit the reef and dropped the ramp, a shell would come in and hit it from the other side of the island. Blasted all the pieces. You'd see the boat blown apart, people blown apart. And this happened half a dozen times. 
sitting there, not being able to do anything to stop it, was one of the worst feelings I had during the entire war. It's a helpless feeling. Those guys needed help. There's nothing we could do about it except watch. I think that uh, Jim Crow at that point had the only radio that was active, and he radioed the the ships, the, the command ship out uh, laying offshore. Don't send in any more troops at all until we figure this thing out and we're able to negate it. As the day wore on, all of the battalion commanders on the beach, three, three beaches as it was called, uh, were very concerned because they knew how many Japanese were there and they figured that there'd probably be a banzai charge in the evening and the dark, dark set in that would really get those of us that were on the beach and hadn't gone in very far, you know? And so uh, uh, there was talk about, from the ship outside, of bringing in the replacement boats after dark. So they put out the word, practically like, for the love of God, don't send anybody in in the dark because we won't know who's on the beach. And as it was, a half a dozen Japanese crawled into our beach in the night and were stabbing the wounded laying on the beach. And the next morning, we had enough people come in behind us to help out. We were able to go down all the way to the other end of the island where we'd been the day before. And there's another tank trap that tied into the one we had. And that night, we were able to secure that tank trap. We had enough people to go back and clean out the damn pillboxes that were behind us. See, everybody, both in the European War and the Japanese War, everybody was dug in. The Germans had wonderful dug-in emplacements, you know. And so you didn't see them until you crawled up, if you did, to throw a grenade in or something like that. But, uh, but uh, it wasn't like the old day wars when people were out on the open plains running against you, you know. Uh, they didn't do that very often because everybody would be killed. Mr. Rao was actually the most intense fighting in a short period that I ever saw. And if you talk about being scared, I was scared on Tarawa. When I first went into combat in Kabutu uh, and Tanambogo, this was a big lark for a 16-year-old. He was having a ball. But there were no more balls from then on. From thereafter, any time I got into an amphibian tractor on an assault, I was scared silly. And each additional assault, I was more and more scared. The, the law of averages was going to catch up with me sooner or later, and I was always afraid now was my turn. In that 76 hours, there were a little over a thousand Marines killed, and uh, about 1,250 some odd Marines wounded and pretty nearly 4,500 Japanese killed. We never actually failed at Tarawa. We, we won the battle and were never really in danger of losing the assault because we outnumbered the Japanese, we outgunned them. It was almost inevitable that we would win and secure the island, but it was a horrific carnage. It was not until the third and fourth days that we finally destroyed the Japanese resistance. We realized we had to get tighter, we had to keep them in maneuvering and had to get them in, in the compact formations, which is what we aim for at Normandy, at D-Day. For years, people had thought of everything that happened and every time we landed, people improved on the ideas and said, well, oh, that worked well, that worked well, this was a problem. Normandy differed from the fighting in the Pacific because when we isolated these Japanese atolls, they rarely could reinforce their garrisons. This was extremely important. In Normandy, it was a huge beachhead, potential beachhead, and the Germans were capable of reinforcing them more rapidly, and they could contain, they could defeat our landings unless we advanced on a broad front, we did it rapidly, we had to gain surprise. You know, their, their main objective that day was to get the men and equipment to the shore. And it was just, you know, pour the coal on, get all the way to the beach, and don't stop until the boat stops. training us at that time for a, 
the Pacific Theater. And we had to do a lot of training within the swamps and living in the swamps and in water almost to our waist. And, but of course, that's what the uh, troops in the, on the islands in the Pacific had to contend with. So they put us through a, a, real, a program that was as realistic as they could, you know. And uh, then uh, they didn't tell us where we were going, but we, uh, and we didn't know until we got, they shipped, over, shipped us over to uh, the port of New York City and put us on the Queen Mary. So uh, it was quite a miserable walk to get on that boat. But then once we were on the boat, we learned immediately that we were headed for England because the crew knew where they were going. And they told us and passed it on to the soldiers coming on ship, you know. They put us in a tent in Ivy Bridge in the cold of winter. This was January. And mud on the floor. We slept in our overcoats to keep warm. We were spoken to by Colonel Charles D.W. Cannon from a stage, just like Patton was in that movie, Patton. And he, he uh, used some foul language. He said, two out of three of you are not going back to the States because we're going to be the spearhead of the second front. Anybody that's got butterflies in his belly, speak up now and we'll transfer you. And they transferred some guys out. The troops had already been uh, designated into boat groups. They were counted off to a specific number of people and task loaded. Uh, at Normandy, they had an assortment of people with various weapons and specialties, a leader in, and, a, and a sergeant in each boat, uh, really about a platoon. And they were well designated, well trained, all to work together. They had practiced for months climbing scramble nets or cargo nets. They had practiced running out of LCVPs. They knew where their place was in the boat. Uh, they had that part of it down. We trained in boat teams. We lived, slept, and ate in boat teams. So we all knew each other. And we trained on the moors with mock-up assault boats. And we, we were trained to go out of the assault boats and fan out and attack pillboxes. And they did it so many times that it became rote. You could do it in your sleep. As we trained for the D-Day landings in England and Wales, we found a number of locations that were actually surprisingly close to the French coastline. And one of them at Slapton Sands actually resembled some of the beach at Omaha actually quite well. You had that sloping soil leading up to the escarpment. It was actually very close. And we trained extensively. Most of the training exercises started off poorly. And then as we advanced and gained experience, actually turned out rather well. Now, the practice landings on the southwest coast of England, which was called Slapton Sands, were a picnic compared to D-Day because the little boats were waiting for us in the water. A nice sunlit day, balmy seas. We climbed down the cargo nets. We got into our little boats. Every man had a certain position. We landed. It was a picnic. We went nice little cruise to the beach and the pillboxes the, the topography was exactly like D-Day, the big 100-foot bluff in front of us. May 15th, we got driven in a truck to a special uh, camp called a sausage because it was shaped like a sausage. We were in Camp D-1. They had a mock-up of the beach we were going to hit in a clay mock-up. We even had airplane pictures taken from P-38s of the Germans working on the beach with these terrible obstacles they were putting in, four rows. One man uh, was so, he was so uh, fearful that he was going to die on that beach that uh, he told me, he said, uh, Sergeant Reynolds, he said, uh, how many times do we have to do this? He said, he said the, the odds that are going to catch up with us, we can't continue with this fighting. And uh, I just uh, shrugged my shoulder and, and, and what, what is there to do except fight? You know, we have no option. So they called it off for 24 hours 
And uh, then when we set sail again, we were immediately introduced to the sandboxes again and our assignments and uh, what was expected of us, the penetration that we were to make. Omaha Beach was four and a half miles long by 300 yards wide at low tide. At high tide, there was no beach. Now, the first division was going to land on the eastern part, which turned out to be the soft part. My other battalions, you know, the second and third battalion, were going to land in between on dog red, dog white. Uh, and each, each had a dog insignia. Ours was dog green, the smallest of the beaches, most heavily defended. It was possible on the first load, and sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't, to load troops right off the deck. They would winch the LCVPs over the side, load the troops, and then lower the whole thing. But if they did that, they would only do it the first time. And so the preferred and typical method were for troops to climb down the, the scramble nets or cargo nets from the troop deck down into the LCVP. And that was difficult, of course, because the LCVP was going up and down and the uh, troop transport would be going up and down. 12 miles out in that st storm that had blown up and uh, canceled the first day, uh, it hadn't let down that day. The prediction was that it would uh, subside, and it did because we made it ashore. But it was still very, very bad. This started very early in the morning, uh, I think as early as 3 o'clock. Uh, they didn't have enough side on the boat to get all the LCVPs loaded at once. It was pitch black, 3.30 in the morning. The weather was horrible. The wind was going at 10 miles an hour. The waves were up to 20 feet high, 15 to 20 feet and they, they had to lower us over the sides already in the boats. But the minute we were lowered over the side, the boats hit the water, were thrown around like matchsticks. Every man was immediately soaked with the icy cold English Channel water. So we were freezing. The water got up to our knees. So in order to stay afloat for three hours, we had to be bailing out with the helmets and we were all freezing. So once you were loaded, you had to take your LCVP with the others who had just loaded, and you would start making circles in the ocean. And of course, that means sometimes you're going with the waves, and sometimes you're going against them. It makes for a very rough ride. That, that was another thing in those assault boats. You smelled that diesel, plus the salt water and the waves would make anybody sick. It was such a stinking mess that that alone <laughs> was enough to kill a man from the stench of the diesel oil and the puke. And... Everybody was very somber in the boat. You couldn't hear anybody talking. There were three guys vomiting in my boat up in the front, sitting in the water and crying. Uh, most of the guys were praying. I was praying. Eventually you get all the people in your landing wave together and they're all going in a circle and somebody decides it's time to go now and then you would come out of the circle into a line and you would charge the beach all together. Dog green sector was so small in length that it wouldn't support a whole battalion landing abreast of each other, 24 boats, not even two companies. So we had to come in in sequence. So we came in A, B, D, and C. Uh, the coxswains were taught to hit the beach and keep full throttle on drop the ramp, everybody unloads. The LCVP is not armored. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the, the ramp is steel, uh, but you know, honestly, uh, they're very exposed. The men, in some cases, were encouraged when they saw the naval gunfire and heard the deafening roars of battleships and cruisers firing into the beaches. The battleship Texas then was part of our firepower, but they had to stay 12 miles out because they had big guns, coastal guns, at Longy Samaire. They could blow the battleship Texas out of the water. So they had to stay 12 miles out. These rough seas, dark of night, they fired over the beach. 
They were only going to fire from 555 to 625 when the guys were going to land, 630. The Navy also had an LCI barge fitted out with 1,000 rocket launchers. They were going to fire 4,000 5-inch rockets at Dog Green Sector, blow up some of the obstacles, get the guys to keep their heads down. Unfortunately, they, were, they had to go 12 miles out. So I saw these rockets coming in. They looked like a flock of birds, but they landed harmlessly in the water. The first thing I saw, a company B boat on my left, port side, blew up, hit a mine. We were showered with wood, metal, and body parts. So we only had 180 men now. When our ramp went down, the signal for every machine gun on that beach to open up on the exit to our ship. The fellow in front of me, Clarice Riggs, was machine gunned on the ramp. I dove in behind him. Only my left side of my helmet was creased by a bullet. I was standing in neck deep, bloody water with my rifle over my head. So we were losing men right and left. The water was full of blood. We started running across the beach. We were about 500 yards out. So we're neck deep in water. When we got to the actual beach, we, the sand was wet and we were, tide was treacherous. It went out fast, came in fast. When we got to about 135 yards away from the seawall, a machine gun spray came from the trenches up on the, uh, the bluff. And I heard a loud thud on my right front and my rifle vibrated. I turned it over. There was a clean hole through its receiver. Another thud behind me to the left and that guy was gone too. I hit the sand behind the hedgehog, which is about 130 yards from the seawall. I went down behind it on one knee, but the fire, the bullets were coming through that hedgehog. And it seemed to me they were coming between my legs, under my arms, it, that I, I uh, realized that, uh, that I had to move. And uh, I got up and in one run made it all the way through that 300 yards or so to the shingles. And that was the next stop that I made. And uh, at the shingles, we couldn't get any further because of the barbed wire, and uh, it held us up. And for about an hour, or a little longer, an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes. Now, there are only two of us alive from my boat team, Charles Connor and myself. Uh, we had 85% casualties first 15 minutes. The Germans zeroed in from their strong points on the beaches, on the likely advancing. Dog Green is a perfect example. They had zeroed in with crossfire. And, you know, they literally shot down many of the men before they even got out of the boats. It was, it was pretty bad. The first wave suffered horrifically. Even the second wave, for that matter. The tide pools were full of bloody water. The beach itself looked like it was painted with a red paintbrush. So we were left with options. Stay there and die, give up the beach to the Germans, or fight wounded. We decided to fight wounded. We learned a great many lessons from these battles in World War II, in some cases the hard way. And one of the things we did was we were able to develop additional landing craft and tactics, such as the LCU landing craft, utility and how we were able to use them for example at Incheon in the Korean War during the Vietnam War we developed the Brown Water Navy as a lot of veterans refer to it in the Mekong and its tributaries we learned about additional tactics we learned how to tighten up our formations we learned to gain the element of surprise we learned to develop naval gunfire support to a fine art we eventually developed vertical envelopment when we introduced helicopters and that enabled us to simultaneously land and flank the enemy on both sides of the beaches at all times which was tremendous strategic and tactical flexibility. We've come a long way since World War II. Uh, we no longer uh, line up, you know, a hundred ships and send them 
uh, towards a beach uh, that's full of enemy defenses. Um, you know, that, that was very costly in World War II. Uh, it was the best that they could do at the time with the technology and the, the capabilities that they had, so they didn't have much of a choice. Um, but nowadays, we, uh, we want to go where the enemy's not, so we want to gain access uh, without going into the teeth of the enemy. Um, so we have those capabilities with our, our, uh, our aircraft to be able to uh, fly in, especially the, the MV-22 uh, gives us a lot longer range uh, to be able to, to insert Marines uh, and troops uh, ashore from the, uh, from the sea. Um, we also uh, uh, have a, uh, our LCACs, our uh, hovercraft landing craft uh, capability that, uh, that goes a lot faster than the uh, landing craft they had in World War II, so uh, a lot longer range with that. We can keep our ships uh, basically over the horizon where they're, they're protected somewhat from the threat more than, uh, more than they were in, in the World War II era. We still uh, have a uh, a uh, forcible entry capability. So with, with our uh, amphibious ships uh, partnered with the carrier strike group and with, well, with all the other uh, abilities that we have, we're, we're able to gain access into uh, uh, countries where we need to gain access to. Um, we're able to put Marines ashore uh, either with our uh, aircraft uh, or our uh, landing craft. Uh, and also with their, uh, their armored vehicles, the uh, AAVs uh, that they have. We, we are the, the legitimate backbone of all amphibious operation. Um, you have certain platforms that are faster than us, but they can only hit in certain areas. Okay, certain beaches are able to scale. Uh, like I said, we're, just like the Higgin boats, we're effective anywhere. As long as there is a coastline, we should be, we can get up on it and do what we have to do. We can handle anything as large as three M1 Abram tanks on board and taking that to a beach and offloading it. We've evolved over the years um, with a lot of lessons learned uh, from our, our brother and sister that sailed before us and in, in, in how to make sure we do this thing, you know, uh, more precisely, uh, safely, um, and with better technology. And that's the key thing. I think the technology has allowed us to be more precise um, in, in, in acquiring the target and then putting things in place uh, pretty much exactly where it's supposed to be. The LCAC gives the operational commanders the ability to do an over-the-horizon assault. We can operate 200 nautical miles from the host ship. Uh, that allows us a lot of leeway on the beachfront. We can carry a 60-ton payload at the speeds up to 50 knots. We open up the world uh, shoreline. A traditional LCU could, could hit about uh, 15 to 17 percent of the shoreline throughout the world, we hit about 70% because we don't have to worry about uh, things like reefs and, and shallow water depth. So it opens up the beach. Our training, we train around our H hour, the time that we're going to hit the beach. And the idea is that the beach is clear when we hit it. We bring the Marines ashore quickly because we're fast. Um, we bring them, they stand up the force and they, they go in and fight the war. But it's all around that same time principle where the bombardment's completed. We're going in as the last shells are hitting. And as soon as that H hour goes, we cross the beach, drop the ramps, let the Marines go, and carry on the battle plan. Do we have the capability to, uh, to do a forcible entry opposed? Uh, we do. Um, but, you know, with possibly significant uh, casualties and, and, and problems that go with that. Um, so we want to go where the enemy's not, gain access, um, and then use our maneuver warfare uh, capability to to get around the enemy and attack those critical vulnerabilities, vice uh, a head-to-head, -head, you know, uh, assault the beach, frontal assault on the beach, World War II type thing.